thank you for being here this uh, beautiful, beautiful evening. It's a great pleasure to have you here and for you to be in conversation with the four of us. It's a great act of generosity on your part, as it is indeed an act of generosity on the part of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. When uh, Yo-Yo Ma asked me to conceive of this panel, I first started with a title. And as you well know, you make up titles, and then you try and run behind them and live up to them. So what struck me that evening was sense and sensibility. This is not your time for dancing, Yo-Yo. You can do that later on. <laughs> this is not your dancing moment. Uh, he's a great dancer, by the way. Um, uh, sense and sensibility, cult, uh, music, and the conduct of life. Yo-Yo was in China, and I heard his voice grow a little quiet, and he said, could you change music to culture? Culture and the conduct of life. Now, one of the issues about large conversations about culture is that they can get very vague, and they can get full of generalizations. And culture itself is an idea, a practice, a set of relationships that needs to be located. And for a moment, I want to locate our conversation in the environs of the place in which we are at the moment in Bombay. So here's the museum, which thank you, Sabia Sachi, for introducing us to this great museum of varied styles. And across from the museum is uh, Elphinstone College, which used to be a great educational institution with the University of Bombay quite close to it. And then, of course, a little further on is are the courts of law, the idea of justice. So here you have art, education, justice. Then there is fort, the fort area, business and commercial ventures, which is very much part of the ethos here in Bombay. And finally you have, no, not finally, but then you have the gateway of India, that great cosmopolitan or the colonial imperial monument about Bombay as a city that welcomes difference, that welcomes foreignness, and actually sends the best of our culture, the best of what we do, into the world. So you have that gateway, that threshold. Finally, of course, you have the Mahatma Gandhi Road, where people of all cultures, faiths, and religion ideally can walk and mingle with security and create a sense of hospitality, both for themselves and for the others. So this is the kind of milieu or the mise en scène in which we are today. And when I thought of this, the streets as being part of the culture or the part of these cultural institutions, I was surprised to read from a text written in 2013 by City Lab that every day Mumbai pavements host, and that's their word, and I think it's a wonderful word, host around 15 million walking trips. 15 million walking trips. And I love the word host. Walking trips that are interfaith, that are transracial, that belong to people of transgender. The streets belong to us all, various castes and classes. And I thought that this was a motif, this sense of circulation, this sense of openness for our conversation today. Now, I believe the word host, the fact that the pavement's host meant a lot to me. And this idea of hosting is part of a larger idea of cultural hospitality. Mumbai is the great city of Indian hospitality. The myths of the art cinema as well as Bollywood is very much the idea, the founding myth of it is that the city can host people from around the world, different ideologies, different views. Strangers, foreigners, the out of work, and we should never forget the out of luck. The concept of culture for today's conversation, my friends, I suggest pivots around this notion of cultural hospitality, which might be the theme of the day. Yo-Yo said to me in conversation not so long ago, 
Culture is a constructed category by humans, and it is culture that establishes hospitality and trust. Let me suggest then that the idea of cultural hospitality is to take classic cultures, canonical cultures, traditional cultures, and by inviting into them the voices of those who have not been heard, the traditions that have not been uh, exploited and, and encouraged, we can actually change both the classic and the contemporary to create a sense of a growing culture that includes people of all cultures, races, and political beliefs. So this idea of cultural hospitality is to me a very central one, and I proposed it to my panelists and friends. And in particular, I think cultural hospitality, <laughs> with its emphasis on differences, is important today because we talk so much about cultural identity all the time. And the narrowness of notions of cultural identity which in a populist world, which many parts of the world today are gripped by a kind of ethnic nationalism, hospitality is dead, and what people want to do is to continually enforce cultural identity. So I thought I would start by asking each of you all, each of you who has experienced a wide range of identities, worked in a wide range of cultural contexts, to ask each of you to think a little bit about this connection or dissonance between cultural identity, which we seem to talk about all the time, and cultural hospitality, which we seem to talk about too little, although our work participates with it, with that concept and engages it. Nandita, why don't we start with you? <laughs> Nandita, am I chairing this or are you chairing this? I'm happy who's to the, hand it Who's the host? Who's, who's the, the host? host here? I want uh, the affirmation that I am the host and that I will be hostile. <laughs> wow, okay. Okay, let's, let's have I don't you even know where to begin. Manto, begin with Manto. <laughs> begin with Manto. Well, As a figure of... Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, culture, it's an ambiguous word in a way, and that's the beauty of it, because it means different things to different people. And the fact that you cannot define it and cannot impose that definition onto the other person is what makes it so rich. I mean, I don't know, what, what is culture for me? It is, it is the influence of everything that I've grown up with, it could be the music, it could be the food, the clothes, the environment, and what I have internalized of it becomes my culture. And I would struggle to I define what is my culture. I would struggle to say what is, what is it to be an Indian. I mean, you know, these are very large words, and the beauty of them lies in their diversities, in the fact that they, have, they mean different things to different people. Um, I think cultural identity, while yes, we've talked so much about it, is still relevant to me because, uh, especially because so many of our given identities, we are made to feel proud or ashamed of identities that we have had nothing to do with. Whether it's your race, whether it's your religion, whether it's your gender, uh, you know, they're, they're the other person is thrusting a certain way in which they're identifying you and you are made to feel proud or ashamed of that identity where you have had no role to play. We are not giving enough emphasis on our, who we are as people. What are our thoughts? What are our actions? What are our, what are our quests? That's not what's defining us. So in some ways, I think cultural identity, the, the conversation around it is here to stay and is not going to go so soon. Hospitality, I know you, in, you introduced this word to this discourse, and we were doing email exchanges before this to understand the panel, and my question was, I haven't quite understood what, it is, what cultural hospitality means, and Homi explained it very interestingly about embracing people, about being the host and welcoming people, and my question would be then, is there a host and a guest? Is there a fluidity between the host and the guest? Who decides who's the host and who's the guest? And you know, uh, are the ones who have the language or the 
ability to articulate it? Are they always going to define who the host is? So I'm still a little unclear about this thing of hospitality because I feel there is a slight bit of inequality between the host and the guest. And I'm, I'm not so sure if I want to be, I just want to be, I just want to be inclusive. I just want things to be more equal, even if it's in a um, utopian kind of an idea. So I'm, I'm still sort of grappling with all those yeah. important words. Yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me just quickly say, right. the question is that there are inequalities. Absolutely. And then the, the nature no of that ini those inequalities make it an obligation, an ethical obligation. But it isn't always the host who defines the terms. The guest mm -hmm. can also define the terms. Very often with migrants in societies, implicitly they have changed some of the norms in, in public life. So I think it's important to see the flow between the two. TM, let me come to you because you've said, no, come I just back to say it. Come just just uh, to add one line to yeah. it, that often they have defined it, but not really because they're empowered to. The fact that they are part of that universe, they will, and who is that they? So, you know, I think it is still unclear as to finally those who have the voice, are they constantly speaking not just for themselves, but for those who do not have that voice? Well, this is why and is that a problem? And I see it slightly problematic. No, this is why I said cultural hospitality, and I don't want to go in on this, is indeed to let in precisely those voices, Absolutely. to create the space of those words. That's what the term is about. Sure. Uh, TM. Krishna. You said TM to me as something about national identities and national culture and the way that constructs it. So could you bring in this whole issue of cultural identity as a national project? Yeah, I think the word culture itself is intriguing. Um, the beauty of culture is also sometimes its ugliness. Absolutely. And I think that's where I'd like to begin because uh, Nandita said something about culture, about it being what is around you, what you grew up with, um, what you felt, what you tasted, what you saw, what you sang, what you danced. But in that relationship is also a sense of ownership of all those things. And that ownership changes the paradigm of that relationship. And it depends on where you are in social discourse hierarchy on how much you can enforce that sense of ownership. Now, when a large group of people, not a large group, a powerful set of people decide, for whatever reasons, that there is this identity building exercise, that it defines a piece of land, a set of people who may be diverse. We, of course, celebrate diversity. This celebration of diversity, yeah. I find, being the most superficial nonsense we've been talking about for I too agree. long. Uh, because it's just bollocks. The fact is we find it exotic yeah. and we treat it as some curio item. Um, and this na the moment you're looking at a national identity, then you want, you, you create this whole story of wanting to bind all of us with one thing that holds us together. Now, I mean, I mean national anthems are built on that, that whole philosophy. The moment that happens, then the whole nature of culture, I think just gets turned on its head very fast. And then, then the problem of what you state and what Nandita also hinted at is the identity versus hospitality or sharing becomes very different because identity becomes very relevant because it depends on who is talking about culture. You know, we are sitting here and having this conversation about culture. Um, and therefore, identity may be easier for us to let go to some extent. To some extent, at least. But then there are communities that where identity is the only way you can establish your relevance in society. That you exist. Tell people I exist. Transgenders have to, have to hold their identity, have to, in fact, put it on your face and say, look, I exist. I'm beautiful. Now, that whole tension is very important. That tension needs to be there. Because only that tension can challenge national programs. Only that tension can challenge exercises which are intrinsically very, very oppressive uh, in their own subtle fashion. And I think that's where hospitality or sharing or being becomes a very, very important way of looking at it. Now, the question is that osmosis or the flow, um, the ebb, how does it happen? How does, how does that movement take place? Because one has to be, I think one has to 
feel a lot about that movement. Um, and therefore, when we say culture is experience, the question is how much are we really experiencing? And that's, a, I think, a very essential question. How much are we letting ourselves experience? Because only when you experience in, a kind, in, in freedom, is there hospitality existent? Yeah. If there's no experience with freedom, hospitality is just another word of saying, I let you in, and that's ugly. Correct. And I think that the issue, of course, must always be, and I'm about to raise this with uh, Yoyo, that we should also not put a huge emphasis and a, a huge burden on those who have been marginalized to assert their identities more than others. Because that is a huge burden to carry the burden of everything. Somebody who's transgender has the right to be transgender in a way that does not have to be pushed in your face. I think that's very important. Let me just move to Yoyo. And I, Yoyo, I'd like here to ask you how the actual the, the playing of Bach, because this is the great Bach project, fits with this notion of the freedom of culture, or cultural freedom, as TM just mentioned it. What is the experience of freedom? I don't know. <laughs> carry on, carry on. <laughs> well, I, I love this conversation because we have, you know, we're struggling with defining things and and but I have a very simple way of describing uh, the 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 hosting and the guesting in terms of performance and and it's very it's very simple I've been a guest in so many places that I visit in cities for many decades I'm always the guest someplace. We're a guest at the museum. We're guests in uh, Mumbai. But it changes. The fluidity changes when we're on stage. Because it's our job to play host. And what's in my mind whenever I perform is, I'm not here to prove anything. I'm here to share something that I love, first of all. And secondly, I think of all of you as my guests there you are. when you are on the lawn, sitting yeah. down, and, it's, and you're, you're invited to a party. Yeah. Now, what we're serving are words, thoughts, ideas, and when I play, it's music. So instead of cocktail hour or appetizers mm -hmm. or the main course or the buffet, if something goes wrong at the party, you know, I drop the roast chicken. Mm -hmm. is, is that the end of the party? Is, is everything over? No, because you're here to have a good time. I'm going to pick it up from the floor and put it back on the plate and say, you can try that, but also there's other food there. So we're not going for perfect culture, idealized culture. We're here to commune together. And, and it's that simple. After I play, I'm a guest again. And God forbid that the person who performs steps off stage and keeps performing and saying, I'm the host, I'm the host, I'm the host, because you're not. And so to, yes. to your mm -hmm. answer, Nanita, you know, I think it's a fluid question. Yeah. I go to my children's you know, show and tell thing. I'm a guest in their classroom, right? And, and so, so it flips all the time. And I think but knowing switching roles is actually makes life really interesting. That's exa yeah, that's you know, exactly the idea. But I want to ask you something. My you children say, Daddy's not in charge when he's home. And the roast chicken that fell on the floor is grabbed by the dog, who is also then the guest. <laughs> Absolutely. But now, let okay. me ask you something. Um, Herbie Hancock, when he gave his Norton lectures, 
said one of the most important experiences in his life as an artist was when he was auditioning for Miles Davis. And he said he was auditioning and there was a, and he played, they were all working, they're jamming together and he played a completely wrong segue or something. It just, he just screwed it. And he said that Miles Davis waited and took it up again and turned it into something extraordinary. And when he apologized after the session, he was also hired, by the way. When he apologized, he, Miles Davis said, no, mistakes or missteps or mistranslations are the ways in which innovation begins. And I thought it might be important now starting this way from you to go back to you and say, how, how does innovation, variation, interpretation come out of the moment when the chicken drops off the dinner table? Well, that's obviously the common theme, right? The, the moment the chicken falls onto the floor. Um, I think, I think before we get to innovation, I think we need in both the arts and sciences the hunch, imagination, right? If you think of imagination as the juxtaposition, the artificial juxtaposition of two different realities. I can imagine myself in the audience. You can imagine yourselves being a host on stage. That takes just a flip of imagination, not a big leap. But if that were to happen, then what happens? So that's, you know, a story w could develop from that. And I think uh, the hunch, whether it's from intuition, from experience, or a deliberate experimentation to say, what if we put, you know, salt and pepper and honey together? What is that going to taste like? And you roast the chicken because we have to talk about the chicken. So, so because, <laughs> but, so the, the, I think innovation happens at the edge of this kind of, of dialogue in every field. So it includes the deliberate uh, attempt to put something together and it includes the accidental. So the Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock is a very good example of that, but there are thousands of examples on, in how discovery is made, how we get to innovation. To you, Tina. I think there is something common between what is perceived as a conscious experiment and the accidental happening. And I think what ties the two together is the ability of the individual or the collective at that moment um, to be completely aware. Because um, it's in that openness that the hunch or the conscious movement actually happens. That whole, when you, you know, when you, when you make music, for example, I mean, I don't like to say make music, just like say when music happens and we happen to be part of it in some fashion. There is, a, everything becomes immaterial. There is a complete awareness. The most important thing about music is not playing, but listening. The most mu important thing about painting is seeing. So when you are listening, really listening, or you're, you're a scientist, you're experimenting or whatever, I think there is a awareness, a complete heightened awareness that is happening. And that's what leads to that moment of noticing that movement that was there and holding on to it, or bringing the pepper and salt and honey together, even if they are in front of you. And I think both the conscious and the unconscious, the subconscious, are results of this state of heightened awareness. And I think that's where the surprise happens. And the, and the, and the act of making that music creates, making, in your case, making music, I want to turn to Nandita, uh, is where the, the process itself creates that heightened moment. Exactly. And then, yeah, then 
And in that, in, that, in that awareness, in that ability to see or listen or what or, or feel is when the process starts Happening. flowing. And, you, and it, it continues. It's a, it's a flow. It's a flow after that. Yeah. Now, I'd like to ask you, Nandita, about the act, the, about directing. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's very important. Here we've talked about individual creativity and individual imagination, in, as, as it were. I want to ask you with, about directing, because when you are dealing with a number of things, sound, script, the, the dolly, the poly, you know, all of that together, music, where does, the, what is that heightened moment where in the midst of, and let's talk practically about the work you've yeah. done, where in the midst of it you think, I could go this direction or that. Give us an example, because many people here have seen your work <laughs> and admire it, and well, the more so. specific <laughs> we can be, the less, uh, right. you know, we, we Yeah, we and can I also here. can't think yeah. in very large so terms. So that would be wonderful so to let's hear from yeah. you. Um, in fact, often people wonder what is it to direct, because you know, good visuals means the cinematographer's done, good performance means the actor's done, good sound, the sound recorder's done. What does a director really do? And yet in cinema, we say director is the captain of the ship. And again, it is that intangible thing that you cannot say, but putting it all together. It's like in an orchestra, what a conductor does. Every instrument is being played by a different musician. But if they were just left, maybe they would do their own thing and it wouldn't all come together. Um, so for instance, like in Manto, what is that magic? What is that mistake? You know, going back to the examples you've been saying, that you, you write. So I worked on the script for four years or five years, researching, writing. You plan a certain scene on the day for instance, we, this Irani cafe, to talk about with our Mumbai cars, the Kayani cafe, we must have done umpteen number of technical rehearsals there. So it's a cafe, there's a big scene there with many writers, mm. progressive writers of the time, and we have planned all our shots. Five days before the shoot, in the middle of the shoot, the owner says, you cannot shoot here because we can't give it to you all night, and we wanted it all night. So suddenly, with no rehearsal at all, we take a small cafe, one-fourth the size of it, in Matunga. Mm. There is no time to do any kind of recce, any planning, short division, nothing. And for me, actually, strangely, it's very liberating. That, you know, I, I haven't really studied filmmaking. I, I don't even watch that many films. I've never assisted anybody. So in a way, I don't know grammar mm. of filmmaking. Mm. And uh, in some ways, it's good, and in some ways, bad, I'm sure. But not knowing also frees you. And not having that fear of failure. You know, what is a mistake? Mistake is defined by, by something yeah. that you would want to do it right. You just want to do. It, there will be mistakes, there will be some things right. You're just constantly exposing yourself and the team in a way to a journey, to a process. And you don't really know how it's going to come out. And then you just do this spontaneous. It was the last day of our shoot, and we were at this Matunga cafe, and it rained and rained and rained. We only had those 12 hours to shoot, of which six hours were, we were soaking wet, so we couldn't shoot. In five hours, I had to do a whole scene with six actors, with actors forgetting their line at three in the morning. And magic happens, and sometimes it doesn't. And what you finally see is not just the magic of the actors or the camera person, but what finally is brought to you. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to name, but one actor kept forgetting the lines. I'm not even going to say his and her, the lines. And uh, the performance has been absolutely praised in that scene. But not one line is complete. It has been cut in s so many times to ensure that the scene moves and you know it, it sort of becomes part of your mise-en-scene, which is not something you planned at all. So uh, sometimes it's, it, can be, it can be scary because it's out of your control. There are 100 factors, 120 people. Uh, one small mistake or a big mistake by someone down in the ladder can happen. You break something important, the sun can vanish. It's not even humanly, it's not even about those 120 people. The cloud suddenly comes and you can't take that shot. So within all that, I think it kind of allows you to let go. For me, Manto journey, making this film, 
has been truly a spiritual journey as well because you just learn to let go so much. When you do not have that control, you're not trying to control it, yet you are the captain of the ship. Uh, you know, <coughs> in, in that journey, that magic happens and then you're not even so wedded to whether it was right or wrong. Because the film is also consumed differently by different people. When someone says, oh, I love the Bombay portion, there are enough people to say, no, I much prefer Lahore. Mm. You know, I, I thought the court scenes were a bit too mm. sort of static, more could happen. Someone says, oh, court scenes were favorites. What is good is that not, there, there's nothing that everybody has loved or everybody has not liked. So finally, you only do what you believe in because you can't think like everyone else. So you are just trying to be honest to what you think is, which is not the best way, which is just your way. But Nandita, I must ask you here about the process of editing. Which is the most exciting part. Which is the most exciting <laughs> part. But it's also, you have a text in a way, you have a lot of material and you edit. And I think that creativity of editing is something that would be very important for you to talk to us about. Because normally people think that the vision of the filmmaker just happens. But that whole process of editing, that whole technical uh, industrial process is such an important way in which creativity expresses itself not spontaneously, but through training, through learning, through watching. And I'd like you to talk about editing. But in filmmaking, the spontaneous and the conscious is actually almost together. Every decision is a conscious decision. At some in level. the shooting? In, in, yeah, and finally the film that comes out. Yeah. Like sometimes people say, oh, did you intend doing that? For instance, some of you have seen, there is a scene where in the hall, Nawazuddin Siddiqui, who's playing Manto, drops a pen and he picks it up. And so many people have asked me, did, it, did the pen really drop? Like, did it just happen and he picked it up? I said, no, it was written in the script. Mm -hmm. The pen drops and he has to. But it should look, obviously, as natural that you don't see. So coming back to editing, I'm sure in music, which, which may not be a Tyagaraj Akriti or a Bach, where it's not completely codified, but when you're creating music, you're also editing it. You're also kind of changing it and transforming it and what finally comes out is maybe different from where you started. And that's what happened. That's why they say in filmmaking, a film is made mm. the second time uh, on the editing table. Because you write it, you shoot it, and when you finish shooting, it's the most difficult part of the most unpleasant almost part of the journey because they just everything that can go wrong goes wrong. And when I finished the shooting, I thought I'd got about 30% of what I wanted. And it's in the editing that it slowly starts you, a film starts emerging. And, th and the scenes that, you, that were very precious at one point and you had written it with such care and it made it to the 10th draft, suddenly you feel, no, I just want to drop it. And it's amazing. And like I said, it's again about letting go. You just drop it because in the service of the forest, you let go of that tree. And, uh, and, and that's why it's a, it's a very, I it's also a very quiet, part of the filmmaking journey. It's just you and your editor. And you all are very fortunate that way, that your work entails also being with yourself and mulling and playing. And like I was saying, in my next life, I totally want to be a musician. I just hope that I have any control <laughs> over it. I want you to be... You started training already, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> but this is a wonderful... I mean, that was really a wonderful uh, a description of editing, which many people can actually empathize with because... You know, we edit our diaries, we edit what we say. To think about the spontaneity of editing, of rethinking something is very important. I wanted to ask both of you, hearing Nandita, uh, and trying to get to the material of the work itself, is interpretation like editing? What is talk about interpretation? You're given this work, You've played it many times. You've interpreted it again and again. You know there's a period when it was written. Form, you know you're playing it now. I have I've earned my bread through interpretations, good, bad, and indifferent. I want to ask you about interpretation in performance. Well, I think there's, I think all of us share a common goal, and, and I will posit this, and you can disagree with me if, 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 you know, if you feel like it. Um, I think, to answer your question, interpreting or performing 
or editing has the goal of keeping something alive, right? And part of performing, keeping something alive means, one, getting your attention so you're not bored and you check your phone for your emails or it's something like that, which is fine if you do, but I feel like my job is to actually grab your attention. And I feel like I imagine every bit of editing is to say, let's make it more clear, more you know, impactful. It, it's got to stay alive. And the reason we do all of this, the way you write your keynotes, the way you perform them, I think it's for one purpose only, is to make things memorable. Because I've, you know, you're all very busy, and I know you're incredibly busy, so if at the end of the year you don't remember what you did in the Mumbai, you know, then why were you there in the first place, right? If a student s spends three days to cram for a test, which I'm sure some of you have done, and you ace the exam and you forget what it was all about the next day, was that worth it? If, I mean, you build that up, it turns into culture. Something is worth remembering the practice of something, right? And, and so teaching, the whole idea of education is you're trying things so that you can actually understand something. And, and, but you have to be open to actually continuing to try because what you understand today may change when new things come in, mm -hmm. right? That's true of science. That's true of culture in terms of, of what we do with migrants. We must change our sense of who we are when new information comes in. But memorability and keeping things alive, I think, are key components to all of the things that all of us are trying to do. Yeah, I want to turn to, uh, to you, TM, and ask you about memorability with things that are ugly and at the same time memorable and beautiful. Now, you know, it's a commonplace thing that, that Satan in Milton's Paradise, part one, really is evil, but really steals the show. And of course, in, in, in God in part two is completely forgettable. So I want to ask you about memory, the things that are difficult. So far we've been talking, I get the feeling of things that are memorable because they're beautiful. Let's talk about the difficulties in culture. Because there were moments when great cultural works were produced at times of fascism, at times of war. I want to know how art and culture can, can and must make what is difficult even what is evil or violent, memorable, so that we know the costs of it and we know that we shouldn't go there, but that in art we can re rehearse it, relive it. Yeah, I mean, that's the difficulty, isn't it? Because sometimes it's so memorable yes. for who we are that everything Hello. Yeah, that's okay. That everything else is erased. And one is art that is produced during very difficult periods. Yes. The other is art which is memorable and beautiful, which has also in its mere existence and commentary erased cultures. Mm. And say you're a practitioner of one of those art forms mm. or, or you're part of a culture that has done that. How does one navigate that? How does one struggle with this enormity of just something exquisite, undeniably exquisite, mm -hmm. but something that is, that has a story for a person standing there, which is completely different from my story. So, but I, you know, I very s sincerely feel that when you allow for that conflict, contestation, 
to play out in your artwork, then it becomes far more memorable. Because then the art or the art object allows for different kinds of perspectives to what it is. It reminds you of the varied things that's gone around it. It reminds you that that's what it is and that's what culture can be. Rather than you protect it and you kind of position it and keep it safe and say, no, this is absolutely pure. This is authentic. Because you, you asked something about, ed about editing and I just want to bring this back. Memory itself is editing. Of course, yes. What does memory do? It edits and that's the beauty and the ugliness of memory too. It yeah. can be a great movie, it can be a terrible film too. It can. And it depends on who's seeing the film too. That's true. And who, having seen the film, has the nightmare. Exactly. Who, yeah, that's true. So, you know, memory itself edits. Therefore, um, this whole process of allowing the ugliness outside or within or that which transfers from each other in the, pro in the, in the process of you making art, which means, going back to something she said about losing control, I think that's a, it's a very beautiful point. Art lives only when there is vulnerability. That's right. That is not just the artist's vulnerability, but the art object's vulnerability too. The film must be vulnerable. The artist is also vulnerable. So when I, when I sing, the experience is about vulnerability. And then I think very interesting things happen. And then, then art becomes what you, you, you suggested, that it reminds you of so many things. It also allows you to, to get from it that intense experience, but it also allows you to ask questions. It also uh, allows you to see things you didn't see before. It does all these things. It can, rather. It may not. But, but TM, there is one issue here that comes up again and again now, which is that in the position of the artist, in the position of the critic, the theorist, whatever, we live our vulnerability. We write out of our vulnerability, and our art objects may themselves articulate vulnerability. But there are many people who feel, not being in that position, that their vulnerability is often exploited by creators who actually depict that vulnerability. You know, I, and I think that is an important issue. Yeah, it is. It is an important issue. Whether we can do anything about it or not is a different matter. Because I think if we take a notion, as all of us have done, that dialogue, interpretation, editing, contestation is absolutely central to the making of art if it is to be memorable, then I think you have to take the risk, the big risk, of hurting people or hurting perspectives. You can't have this protected oh, no. art object. It also means that you also, you also can be hurt. Of course. So if I make a, f make a film about uh, the condition of Dalits, for example. I was thinking okay. just that. Okay. Yeah. And I have a certain perspective. I'm not going to say flawed or what. It is a perspective. It can be problematic and say it says things. But I must be, oh, I must be, I will also be challenged by a person from, a, from say, the Dalit community who's going to say, this is not the story I want to say. This is not my story. This is a story of an upper caste Brahmin who thinks that he knows all about Dalit culture. But fine, let that let those things contest each other, right? And let there be a let there be a problem there, and that conversation must happen. Yeah, but the conversation will happen if the Dalit or whoever it is has the institutional and cultural authority and power. And this brings me to something that I know Yo-Yo is very interested in. You are very interested, in, so are you and we all are, which is the role of education today in the societies in which we live, which are complex societies, societies often of strife. Half the world is at war and has been for, you know, over almost 20 years. Uh, vast migrations and refugees, you know, 67 million in the world today, almost the 21st largest countries of displaced people. In this context, I want to ask each of you within each of us, but I'll come in the end, in our different areas of expertise, how we think of a musical education, how we think of a film education. I think, and I know, 
you you always look innocent when I pose the question, but you've been deeply, deeply involved in educational processes in Chicago, in New York. So talk about those um, uh, projects of yours. Um, well, I, I think in Chicago I worked a lot with younger musicians thinking who want jobs. And they think that if they get a steady job in an orchestra, that's it, they've made it. But on the other hand, there's so few jobs available. It's kind of a crazy idea that you have hundreds of people wanting like five jobs. And so I spent a lot of time going around the city and saying, well, what's the need in different places? And maybe instead of saying, this, you, these are the five jobs that are available, let's think about what's needed. Where could you be needed that people have not been thinking about? And so we started going to the communities, and in Chicago there are certain areas that have tremendous amount of shootings. Average weekend, 40 kids get shot. And it's, it's actually, and nobody knows how to solve that problem. But we figured out a way of actually acknowledging the, fa the child that gets shot by going to the parents and saying, what was your child's favorite song? What did he or she like to do? How would you like to memorialize that person's life by picking a song or writing the song, writing the words, and we'll put it on a website. And we will get musicians together, singer, songwriter, arrange it, we'll record it, we'll put it on the website. And for me, and for the young musicians, playing for the parents sitting in a circle, recording the piece, was probably the most important music lesson they could learn because they immediately know why they're doing it. The purpose of healing in order for life to go on is absolutely there. So, so, I think, so I think I think there are many ways to talk about education, but I think all of us at all times have to ask, you know, what education for whom? And I think so we a lot we talk a lot about equity and and for me equity is access. You know, so to give people, so I think, I don't think hierarchically in music, because when you make something and you create something, you've gotta be in a safe place. And so when I first met Krishna and Nandita, there was an immediate moment of recognition and trust that made me think, fine, we could talk about anything and it's gonna be okay. We want to establish that, first of all, because without that safety factor that you're not going to be bullied, you're not going to be you know, trashed for risking a thought. Mm. Right? Very important point. Really, really important. So I think those are the, the, the fundamentals from which curiosity and learning can take place. So TM, now let me put this delicately. You come from a musical culture that can be very hierarchical and hieratic. Um, you have had your own views on this and your own struggles with it in trying to create that safer space for a larger group. And you've also taken the music and introduced into these classical or canonical forms other kinds of musics of more of other people, this, you know, the notion of hospitality, Dave Darcy's and other musics 
So you've hybridized the music in very particular ways. Can you talk about that experience, both about the about trying to de-hierarchize music and democratize it in some uh, way without sacrificing quality and craft. I think that we must say again and again. Well, I think um, it all began for me uh, with a very simple question, why was I singing this music? It was actually, ju it was just that question. Why am I singing? I mean, yes, I, I know the obvious answers, but I really wondered why I was doing this. So that led me to the exploration of history, musicology, theory, and all these things. And the moment you start actually studying music in that sense, you realize it's not just about music, it's about people. It's about human beings. It's about uh, uh, you know, the movement of people, the discarding of people, the in inviting certain kinds of people. And then, and then it started asking me very important questions about my own identity, my own being, uh, my own sense of nation, my own sense of culture. All these things was part. So actually, the changes began organically in the way I sang. It was not something I had control over. I just realized I was, I was doing things. And you know, post facto, you intellectualize it, of course. But at that moment, I was not. But who were you rubbing up against? See, the classical culture in any country of the world needs to think very hard about itself because it comes with enormous power. And I'm talking about cultural power, not numerical power, but cultural power, intellectual power. So all, so, and I like to say so-called classical because I think the word classical itself needs serious thought. Um, so nevertheless, um, so I was rubbing up against this classical culture, which in India has religious connotations, has caste connotations, many things, right? Uh, and then introductions of, of changing the, the form in the sense, allowing it to, to speak to ma speak many voices, voices and speak to many, vo many voices too. But then very soon, <laughs> I also realized that this is not an evangelical project. Right. You know, that's also condescending. Of course. Enormously condescending. So it had to be a multi-directional conversation, more than a two-way street. And that's when I started digging myself into different art forms, different cultures, which are very distant from my sense of culture. And the, how do you create these conversations? How do you create aesthetic platforms where you can create those conversations, whether it is in a, in, in a school of art or whether it is in performance, whether it is in, in dialogue, how can you? And how can you allow them um, to, in a way, look at each other? And because art is a way people, under, you know, you understand people. Ultimately, art is about people. So I'm, I have this great faith that if you allow art to happen in complex, or shall we say in diverse, in very eclectic environments. Could be, like you said, the pavement, for example. We were talking about playing, you know, singing in, in public spaces just as we walked here. And all of us said we should do that. And why did we say that? We said that because primarily it allows for so many different mirrors, so many different reflections, and there is a joy in it, but there is also discomfort maybe in it. There is also freedom in it. There are so many things happening. We've got a plan. Yeah, we have a plan too. I think that's where the conversation is headed. Yeah, I want to ask Nandita, I take exactly what you say. I love the emotional an imaginative power of it. Too bad he's not passionate. He's very, yeah, that's right. He's a little bit tepid for us. He's very tepid. But I think the important issue... I have to compensate for his yeah. very studious <laughs> self. I think that one of the issues is that you can, once you can sing with confidence, you can do these things. And that, I think, is very important. That's why I brought the educational issue up. And for you, Nandita, I would, I would never typecast you simply as a woman actor or director. Because I think that, 
No, no, but I'm not talking about your mothering skills, which I know are well, fantastic. I, I, I've I'm started thinking about education yeah. much more but since I'm I've just, become no, a mother. But let me so. just say this. How do you, as a mother... That's a as man saying. No, as a mother... Have understood, but never I have. understand that completely. The question at the moment is, how do you, as an actor, deal with the vulnerability of gender issues, of being a woman, mother, director, with a different kind of routine. That vulnerability that you talked about is part of your everyday life as well as your professional life. And I want to know how that vulnerability turns into a strength, which it has done in your case. I think you just try and be yourself. You know, we tend to intellectualize in retrospect on panels. But if you are vulnerable, you're not thinking all the time, I'm being vulnerable. Because in that is also, there's a kind of positioning then. Let me be vulnerable so that I can be creative. We don't do that, right? When you are vulnerable, you just, you're just vulnerable. What does being vulnerable mean? means you're just opening yourself. You, you're making mistakes. You're asking questions. You're not playing into that hierarchy. As an actor, and because I was a hesitant actor, I didn't sort of go through the ropes of casting and trying out various things, doing a small role, then getting a bigger one. I didn't go through all of that. From my first film, I played a lead role, and you know, so I was always in that sense on the top end of the hierarchy. And it was just as uncomfortable, especially because I came from a social work background where the emphasis is on all about being equal. And then you come into an industry, that word itself is a different yeah. beast. <laughs> you know, you don't think of your work as an industry. I still don't feel comfortable after 22 years of acting, but you come into this field where you're constantly being told <coughs> that, you know, you'll never become a star because you're, you sit anywhere, you talk to people, you have to maintain a certain amount of distance. You basically are saying that do not be vulnerable. I remember when I did my first film, a good friend who's a filmmaker told me that if you don't know an answer to a question, always pretend you know it because people want to see a confident director. They want you to think that you know everything. And I'm like, no, a director is not supposed to know everything. You're also finding out. It's also a journey that you're taking. So vulnerability, you're right, is often seen as a weakness. Mm. But I don't think one should be too self-conscious about these things, because then you lose yourself. So you just do what you think is right and in through through that your vulnerability does get exposed it sometimes you are trampled over sometimes it is seen as a weakness all of that happens sometimes you do feel bad about it as well but that's also a journey but do you think i mean i read so much in the papers here and in the states uh, recently that women actors and women directors have a certain inbuilt problem in the institution so that I'm saying they uh, they do have a I mean you are very fortunate <coughs> long may it last that as you said you were at the top end there are people who are struggling to get there and I feel that a, an education as the kind we've been talking about has to create an equality so that women feel with their best talents they can get there and they will get the opportunities. Not just that, and even as a woman director, of course you face sexism, of course you, the way people talk to you, and the subtler it gets, more subtle it is to negotiate through that. Mm -hmm. If somebody just slaps you, you can hold that person's hand. Mm -hmm. But it's not like that, it's in the words they use, the way they talk to you, even if you're helming the project. You can feel it because being on the other side, I know if I had I been a male director, they would have not spoken like that to a director. So you know it, but you still can't point it. So there are, but I'm not so sure if I would say education is the thing because then uh, the disparity or the inequality on, in gender should only be in the lower class where there is maybe less education or no education. This, whether it's domestic violence, whether it is sex discrimination, whether it's female, Decide whether it's dowry, death, enough. We have enough figures to show it often happens in affluent, educated classes. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves what kind of education are we giving to our children? And that's why I said, being a mother, I think I'm looking at education more minutely now 
Though I have had a little bit of an experience, I taught at Rishi Valley, which is a lovely school I know, I know started it. by J. Krishnamurti, and I engaged with it. And I felt that things like empathy, things like compassion, you know, things like asking questions, these are not enough encouraged or taught. So what education are we really talking well, about? Well, that's the question I'm posing because I'm, and I don't mean education only as textbook education. I'm thinking about education in a more general sense, the kind of education you get by being in the social media, the education you get by writing, the education you receive in the museums. I'm suggesting that we need to create a sense of responsibility uh, and obligation and an ethics of equality that will allow people to be able to display their vulnerability. My question is that pe not all people can do it because they have to be self-defended. They have to be able to sure. present themselves also as knowing if they don't know. Let me finally... Can I just sorry, yeah, bring in sure. a little bit about your your ma if you may allow me to. Um, you know, of course, like all of us must have gone and we watched you perform the other night. We have Krishna and I have had the pleasure of spending the afternoon with you. And I really want to bring in the role of the artist and the art. What is it that really sets you apart? And I'm not flattering you on your face, but truly is the person behind the artist. And in your brochure too, you've written that I'm first a human being, then an artist, and then a cellist. So I think whether you're a teacher, whether you're an artist, what is your integrity? How much do you care about sharing your art? You know, why are you sitting on Marine Drive and playing or going and collaborating with various local artists or in your own performance getting young people to play with you and be just one of the instrumentalists? I think it, the person behind the artist is just as important as the artist. And that's education. So really, a big clap. Tell us, I have tell us about so the much. person behind the artist. <laughs> yes. Well, um, a shadow of his former self. Um, I, you know, it's it's funny. You started talking about parenting, and I know you have children also. You have children, and there's nothing that is more educational than being a parent. <laughs> it's it, it's. It's the humiliation, the vulnerability, the lifelong learning. But to your question, I'd like to say that once you have a child, at least I realize it's no longer my world. It's, you know, it, in some ways it's a great relief because, well, now that I'm a grandfather, it's even a greater relief because, because it means that the world that my children, the vocabulary that my children speak is different from my vocabulary. So when I work with 30-year-olds, or even 40-year-olds, or even 50-year-olds, it's, it's their world. And, and my world is actually less and less important. Which is, which is great in terms of giving freedom because as a 60-year-old, I can say anything I want because if I say something really stupid, people will say, well, you forgive the guy because he's 60 years old. But if you say something, you know, that has some meaning, says, wow, he's 60 and still can make some sense. And so it's, it's really, you know, I, I recommend this age all of you. It works a little differently in India, but go not ahead. So old. In India, the older you get, wisdom just keeps dawning on you. You can say all you want when you're 18, they'll all believe you. So maybe I should move to India. You should. And, and you, should. <laughs> you should. You should. You have all the prerequisites. Except for the wisdom, because you're still so youthful. Um, um, I think we're going to, and I'm not quite sure the order of this. I, I know that Bhanti Chand wants to say a few words. Uh, Bhanti, where are you? Yeah. Do, Bhanti, do you want to speak after the performance? Yeah, after the performance, right. So now we thought we would have a spontaneous moment of creativity. Uh, let us turn.
to both our musicians here and to you if I you want. And, and if you Nandita want. is going to actually yeah, participate. I'm given a task. And I'm going to also Soccer participate. Yes, absolutely. By listening. No, no, no. <laughs> by, by That's absolutely good. But okay. you're welcome to join us. And we'll just sort of look at you and you will know what to do. Okay. Please. You know I'm going to be singing at that time, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do, and I think you wanted me to speak to this a little bit, um, is I'm going to play the beginning of a Bach Sarabande, the origin of which um, inspired Krishna to create a response because um, the, the, the dance form, a Saraban, came from North Africa and was danced by Bedouin women. And when that dance was emigrated to Spain, it was banned because it was considered lewd and lascivious. Yeah, you know? Who knew? Um, so it was banned, and, and when you ban something, it goes somewhere else because nothing ever truly dies, right? So it went to South America, it went to France, and then Bach took it as a saraban, and it is, and it inspired Krishna to, to, to say, well, you know, you play a little bit, and I'm, I'm gonna do something, and it actually of the same flavor. So we just had this conversation this afternoon. Um, and the story was an important story. And I, I will try and take a line from what he's going to play. And I'll connect it with um, a composition which is part of the repertoire of the Devadasis. Because in Indian cultural history, Indian cultural history, the role of the Devadasis was very important as musicians, dancers. And their story has been lost. And the abolition of the Devadasi system was essential for the exploitation that was happening to these women. But their aesthetic beings, their, their cultural beings, their, their 300, 400, 500 year, year old musical dance history was all lost. And therefore, my response will be some improvisation, which I hope to link to a little what they call a javali and I'll probably hand it back to you.
Sada 